Good evening and welcome. Uh, this is an uh, event thrown by the new Centre for Social Cohesion. My name is Douglas Murray and I'm the director of the centre. And thank you for coming to tonight's event. Um, I should also say a particular thank you um, for putting up with the security requirements that uh, sadly an event like this um, entails. Um, but we're very grateful you to come here tonight. Before we start, I'm afraid I've been asked by the venue to read out what you do in the event of a fire. Um, uh, for your safety and as part of the health and safety policy of this institution, we're required to tell you what to do in the case of an emergency. On hearing the fire alarm, please leave this hall immediately by the central doors to there, the door at the back of the hall, or the door to the left of me. Uh, leave the building immediately by the nearest fire exit, turn left along the pavement without crossing the road, pass beyond the end of the building, wait at the bottom of cockpit steps, beyond three birdcage, walk further instructions. Thank you. Uh, obviously, basically, just leave the burning building. Um, but... Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, tonight to have uh, two such distinguished speakers uh, to debate the issue of our time. I can't think of uh, a better pair of speakers to have. Um, Ed Hussain is the author of the best-selling book, The Islamist, uh, which charts and describes his personal journey um, from membership of the radical group, his book, Tahir, uh, to his present uh, position as one of the uh, most celebrated and I think most eloquent uh, ex people to explain uh, the Muslim faith and what it means to be a Muslim in Britain today. He uh, writes regularly for The Guardian, The Times, The Sunday Times. Uh, he appears on Newsnight, CNN, uh, and Al Jazeera with great frequency. It's a great pleasure to have him here tonight. Um, we're also joined um, by Ayan Hasyali. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to have Ayan in uh, Britain from her new home in the United States of America. Um, she is most recently the author of the best-selling autobiography, Infidel. Uh, she was, until last year, a member of the Dutch Parliament and I think is without doubt one of the most uh, famous uh, speakers on this subject. Um, she most recently uh, came to international attention when the Dutch government withdrew her, her security protection, uh, requiring her to, uh, as is currently the case, raise money privately for her much needed protection. And a fund has recently been set up for that. And I hope we can pass on information if anyone's interested in contributing to it. Um, anyhow, without much further ado, um, we'd like to kick off the, tonight's debate on Islam and the future of the West. I'm going to invite Ed Hussain to speak first, then Ayan Hasyali. There'll then be questions. But first of all, Ed Hussain. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, can I begin by thanking the Center for Social Cohesion for organizing this debate, Douglas in particular, and Hannah for putting in so much time. And thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get straight to the point. I mean, I agree with Ayan on several issues, the oppression of Muslim women, domestic violence, forced marriages, extremism in Muslim circles. But we also disagree, and we disagree on much. And I think my primary point of digression from Ayan's discourse is the fact that Ayan quite openly um, say, has said on at least one instance that the war on terror shouldn't be a war on terror, but should be a war on Islam. I speak on someone, as someone who once upon a time had a mindset that would endorse, applaud, find something positive in martyrdom operations, so-called martyrdom operations in Palestine. Osama bin Laden would have been a freedom fighter. For me to get away from that mindset, it was answers that I found within Islam and not from without that took me and others out. So when, when, it, when Ayan and others talk, talk about extremism and eradicating extremism and then say that, that the war on terror should in essence be a war on Islam, I see no difference in people like Zarqawi or Zawahiri, bin Laden's second in command and bin Laden himself saying those very things and others who are in theory, at least, fighting those people, also coming out with the same rhetoric. So it's a problem, I think, from within Islam to see, well, what exactly is going on here. And also, Ayan and others have called for a reform of Islam, and I don't stand for a reform of Islam. I think Lord Cromer had it right when he said, in Islam reformed, is in Islam no more. For me, it's about renaissance. It's about what the Prophet Muhammad said, tajdeed of Islam. And that tajdeed, that renaissance, that sense of renewing Islam, comes from within Islamic tradition itself. And I'll try to illustrate today 
uh, you know, one or two examples of how that's done from within Islam and not necessarily from coming without. Islam rescued me from extremism. There's a member in the, of um, Hezbo Tahrir, the extremist organization in, here in Britain, a, a leadership member who left recently, Majid Nawaz, who spent time in prison, who sits here at the front today. Um, it was Islam and Islamic pluralism that took him out of extremism and then took him out to a path of condemning extremism. Usama Hassan, Sheikh Usama Hassan, who is also in the audience today, uh, someone who fought in the front line of the battle in Afghanistan, left extremism and came out and today quite openly speaks out against several Muslim practices, which I'll allude to later on. Asim Siddiqui, head of the City Circle, who's sitting in the audience today as well, who was raised on literature that uh, uh, sort of paints a Demonist worldview, Maududi based, Sayyid Qutb based, who also left and came out. All of us and hundreds of others out there who are extremely, uh, who are now moving out against extremism, came out because of answers we found within Islam and not without. Now, before I move on to, um, you know, what can we practically do to foster an Islam and, and its relationship with the West that's positive and harmonious, I want to sort of clarify uh, two or three misconceptions most people in the West, particularly the Western intelligentsia, have about uh, Islam. I'm not here to defend Muslims. I'm here to defend Islam. I find much to be condemned among contemporary Muslim practice. But the first thing to say is that Islam a religion is not Islamism, a political ideology. Islamism is a political ideology set up in the 1950s by people, uh, and earlier in the 1940s, by people like Maududi, who was the first in Muslim history to say that Islam is a political ideology. And before Maududi's writing in the 1940s, a Pakistani journalist, nobody referred to Islam as a political ideology. You can ask where he got those references and uh, influences from, but he was the first to do so. Sayyid Qutb, an Egyptian literary critic, took those teachings to their logical conclusion and advocating overthrowing every single Arab government, setting up a state that had a, an expansionist, expansionist totalitarian foreign policy, and you know, to cut a very long story short, anti-Western rhetoric, anti-fellow Muslim rhetoric, most Muslims were, considered, were not considered to be Muslim enough if you weren't a member of what they call the Islamic movement or fulfilling your obligation to establish what they call an Islamic state. All of these are modern conceptions, but broadly speaking, that's what Islamism, a political ideology, is all about. We in the West often confuse Islam, a 1400-year-old spiritual tradition, with Islamism, the political ideology. Islam is a religion like all other religions. In the, in the, in, in the language of the Quran, you know, we believe that God talks about the word deen to describe Christianity as, and Judaism as well as Islam. But modern Islamists equate Islam with capitalism and socialism, so that again is indicative of a certain mindset. The second issue I want to try and highlight and sort of clarify misconceptions about is the Sharia. The Sharia has received bad press over the last uh, few years, um, to put it mildly, but the first thing I think to concede is the Sharia is not a monolithic entity. It's not cast in stone. To say that it is, is to give credence to the argument of Islamists and Saudi Wahhabists who want to tell us that the Sharia is something from the past already designed, devised only to be, quote unquote, implemented. Sharia is in flux. It adopts, it adapts, it always has done. Take, for example, the arguments of a great classical Muslim scholar known as Imam Shatibi. Um, you know, he was the first, I think, perhaps second after Imam Ghazali, who, who, who codified objectives of the Sharia. So sharia is there to honor life, honor, uh, to honor life, honor religion, reason, and property. It was later that Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and others also echoed similar, similar ideas. The point I'm trying to make is to say that the Sharia is fixed and we must implement something is to give credence to an idea that's modern, an idea that's there served by a certain political ideology. But you may ask, what about stoning? What about those practices that we find so horrendous? Well, my contention is yes, stoning is condemnable, but stoning didn't come about firstly and foremost with Islam. The Prophet Muhammad adopted the Jewish community, also practiced, look at Leviticus, and you have you know, at least 13 to 14 different verses talking about stoning, killing people who have committed different kinds of sins. So there's nothing new about that practice. It was a practice of the Abrahamic faiths in the past, and it's a practice that most uh, you know, countries and religions have done away with, and it's a, it's a practice I think most religions, most Muslims today don't implement. Um, a, th a, a third area would be apostasy. Um, I, I grant that Mus there are Muslim attitudes of intolerance when it comes to those who have left the faith. I grant you that. But to say, as it's said often in our newspapers and our broadcast media, that killing apostates is in the Quran, you can't prove that.